So I am Stephanie Rodriguez. I am the cabinet secretary of the New Mexico Higher Education Department. I'm a proud graduate of our university system here in the state of New Mexico. And I know how critical it is to develop systems for students to succeed. Um, so one huge accomplishment of this administration was making sure that we had a higher education department and system that was student centric versus institution centric. In New Mexico, we're really trying to develop a cradle to career pathway for New Mexicans. And we've done that by establishing the Early Education Trust, which many of you had supported in the past and continue to support. So thank you for that. We also put over $3 billion into our K-12 system. However, when we get to higher education, it's almost like a pause and it's sitting there and thinking about what can we do? What ecosystems can we create in higher education that fosters that continuation of learning for New Mexicans so that they can enter family sustaining wages and careers right here at home and we don't lose them. So that's been a huge effort of the Lujan Grisham administration and something I was tasked with um, in the beginning of COVID when I went over to the department temporarily and ended up staying. Um, was what can we do? And the governor's response was tuition-free college. And we are excited to be the state in the nation that is leading this charge for the most inclusive, comprehensive, all-encompassing, simple tuition-free college program that we have seen. Uh, so with that, I also wanna just acknowledge all of the work that we're doing with all of our sister agencies. So the Early Childhood Care Education and Care Department, Public Education Department, and Department of Workforce Solutions are actually investing in a New Mexico longitudinal data system. We're one of the few states who do not have this system in place, but the reason why it's so critical is we're going to start seeing what types of investments in New Mexico actually work for New Mexicans, and we'll be evaluating tuition-free college through this data system um, in addition to K-5+. plus. Um, other programs that support infants and toddlers through the Early Childhood Education and Care Department, and then also pulling in workforce solutions data to see if New Mexicans are actually being employed in our high need, fastest growing sectors in New Mexico. So that's another project that we're very passionate about and working on. So with that, let's jump into the presentation. I want to give some history context to how this was developed and then also share an amazing resource with you all at the end. So first slide, a lot of people may or may not know this, but New Mexico actually was the first state in the nation to tell recent high school graduates that they can go to college tuition free through the legislative lottery scholarship. And after enacting the legislative lottery scholarship, what did we see in New Mexico? Well, we saw an increase in enrollment. We also noticed an increase in enrollment where it mattered most which is New Mexicans actually coming into our state system versus a target audience of out-of-state students. We also saw an increase in enrollment with Hispanic and Native American students at all of our higher education institutions across the board. And as a matter of fact, between 1970 and 2010, New Mexico has seen one of the largest enrollment increases compared to any other state with similar population sizes and demographics of 265%. And a lot of folks attribute this not only to the lottery scholarship, but also open enrollment and access opportunities for students to apply to our community colleges and branch campuses without the limitations of a GPA, right? So that's something that we've been seeing. An effort I want to touch on before I really dive into lottery opportunity and lottery scholarships is actually readynm.gov. And I really encourage everyone to take a look at that website. Um, our pandemic hit and the governor and the Department of Workforce Solutions and our agency really had to jump into action to address workforce challenges and changes um, while we were in a global pandemic. So enter our state initiative, Ready New Mexico. And this is a partnership between the New Mexico Higher Ed Department, our agency, and the Department of Workforce Solutions that aims to provide easy access for individuals and businesses across New Mexico 
to actually understand what training and career options are available in your own backyard and communities. Because we wanted to see New Mexicans actually upskill and reskill in the face and wake of a global pandemic and then potentially go back into the workforce in these higher wages. Um, Ready New Mexico has a section for citizens to explore all our colleges and universities, particularly vocational education programs, so that they can get into those careers and also have those things added to their resume so that they can really be competitive in this market. And it's very easy to use. And true story, my niece was working out of El Paso, Texas. We lost her to Texas. However, um, when we went through some family uh, stuff in our family during the pandemic, she used Ready New Mexico to find vacancies in Doña Ana County and applied to become a nurse at one of our community-based health centers and got employed in a matter of a month using the Ready New Mexico. Oh, and Stephanie, you got muted for some reason. There you go. Sorry about that. So in exploring Ready New Mexico and evaluating next steps and researching our current higher education landscape, we noticed a couple of things that really helped lead the tuition-free college conversation. So one, in the past 10 years, New Mexico has added over 10,000 new jobs with an annual salary of $90,000. However, we want to make sure that these students are at, or the people who are being employed are New Mexicans. And when we were researching these jobs, most of them required a post-secondary credential, whether that be a certificate all the way up to a graduate degree. And then two, the average age of a college student in New Mexico is actually 26 years old. It's not our recent high school graduates. Although that's a demographic that we need to continue to target, we really need to venture into the sphere of non-traditional students such as returning adult learners, working parents, individuals who lost a lottery scholarship back at the day and have not fin finished their degree. Um, so we found that we needed to find a way to invest in New Mexicans to actually go to school or go back to school while understanding that our demographics are not an 18 year old, it's actually our older New Mexicans who need some attention when it comes to training and career programs and higher education. Next slide. So let's talk about opportunity. Um, remember we were the first state in the nation to do a tuition free college program? Well, we, start, we made history again nationally by establishing the Opportunity Scholarship. And this program is really a game changer. It's flexible, it serves nearly all New Mexicans. New Mexico residents can go to school part-time or full-time and it covers career training certificates, associate degrees, and bachelor's degrees. Um, and the New Mexico Opportunity Scholarship also ensures that New Mexicans have a chance to gain the skills our workforce needs in New Mexico. Um, so we are really excited to be a kind of a game changer in the nation when it comes to this. And all students have to do is maintain a 2.5 GPA. Um, that mirrors the lottery scholarship. We tried to keep a lot of the lottery and opportunity scholarship language very similar but then also adjust it, understanding that lottery really focuses on recent high school graduates and honorably discharged veterans, whereas opportunity is the one that focuses on the more non-traditional sphere and demographic of New Mexicans. Next slide. So this is actually a slide showing you the decreases in enrollment uh, throughout time in New Mexico, and it has been decreasing. And what we're really hoping is since we're targeting a new demographic of New Mexicans, our working parents, our adult learners, we're hoping to see the trajectory of uh, enrollment actually increase over time. And I have a lot of data and information on this, but I'm not going to bore you with that. And instead, I'll jump to the next slide, which is the Opportunity Scholarship Investments and why I need your help. So the last three years, we started with $10 million. It was a very restrictive program that actually only allowed students to go to school full-time for associate degrees. And so in that, we actually closed the door on a lot of New Mexicans right when the pandemic hit this nation and uh, the globe. And uh, we didn't get as much traction as we needed. 
However, the majority of the students that we were serving through the first year of the Opportunity Scholarship were actually Hispanic, Native American, also young parents, and individuals who were looking to go back and upskill, reskill, or change their career pathways, which was really exciting that we could share that data and that information with legislators, which brought us to 18 million last year. And fortunately, it was opened up to individuals getting certificates, associate degrees, and bachelor's degrees. And this year, we broke the record with $75 million being infused into the Opportunity Scholarship with the stuff that I'm presenting to you now. And we even received $130 million infused into the Lottery Scholarship, which will get us tuition-free education for recent high school graduates and discharged veterans for four to five years, potentially. Next slide. Um, so I just kind of want to close with this before we jump into something that we're really excited about and we need your help in sharing. But Opportunity Scholarship is only 1% of the overall state budget. I talked about how we really invest in early education and K-12 education, but that has to continue on to higher education. Additionally, with the Opportunity Scholarship and Lottery Scholarships, we can see that New Mexicans will generate almost $200 million in revenue when they earn degrees just with these programs alone. And that's a 130% return on investment by just investing in our fellow New Mexicans to ensure that they can succeed. And with that, um, Patricia, I'm going to ask you to go to our wonderful website, which is reachhirenm.com. So reachhirenm.com is a one-stop shop for individuals to truly understand what these scholarships are and how to access them. Because right now it's very confusing. Some of you are probably like, I don't even know anything about this. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to access it. I don't know where to point people if they're calling me about these scholarship programs. So we're going to pull up the website and really ask you to help us in sharing it. But before we ask you to do that, I want to show you how great this website is and how we really did sit down with constituency groups and ask them, how can we create something that's very easy to use and navigate for New Mexicans? And so what it is, is reachhirenm.com. We found that people don't want something governmental. People don't want to look at something that looks like a government agency or screen when they're learning about programs. So we really looked at how do we brand higher education in a way that's less intimidating and very easy and simple to follow. And that's where Reach Higher came into play. So Patricia, I'm gonna have you click on the click here to get started button. And what this is is a very brief seven question survey in which a student can go through it and find out if they qualify for lottery or opportunity scholarship or neither, because maybe it's someone out of state and of course they would not qualify for our programs. So this is something that we've been introducing to students and parents to understand which programs students can actually qualify for. Patricia, I'm gonna have you exit out of that please by clicking the, don't go back, click the blue text on the bottom that says close window. Thank you. And if you scroll down, what is tuition-free higher education? What does it cover? It's right there, very simple, easy to understand in what I presented on. We're gonna scroll down a little bit further. How it works, it's three easy, simple steps. It's not an additional application, which is something we've been really having to tell folks, no, it's not an extra application, it's just you applying to college. So we're telling students and future students to apply in a college that you're interested in, complete your FAFSA, because we want you to capitalize on any other scholarships and federal grants that you could qualify for, for the cost of attendance outside of tuition and fees, which is a really unique thing to our program compared to the rest of the state. And then enroll in college part-time at a minimum of six credit hours. Go ahead and scroll down, Patricia. We also created a map to show students visually where there are schools by where they live. And if you scroll down a little further, you can actually pick the county that you reside in and it will pick schools within that county or surrounding counties. And then you can also pick what type of degree program or certificate, um, I'm sorry, what kind of degree you are interested in, whether that's a certificate, associate degree or bachelor's degree, and it will pull up all of the schools 
that you uh, potentially could apply to. So Patricia, I'm going to have you go back uh, to selecting all counties and all schools or all programs. Because this is another really important component. Click the, the first thing on top, choose. Yes. And then uh, same thing there. When students come to this website, we wanted to have everything there for them to look at and who to contact. So for every single school and tribal college, we put information about where it's located, their website, their financial aid offices, and their financial aid emails and uh, numbers. And additionally, students can actually go directly to the application by cl clicking apply now or apply today. Um, rather than trying to find it on their own on the website, which can be a lot to take in. And if you scroll down, the last thing that we have is frequently asked questions pertaining to both the lottery and opportunity scholarship. So when this passed, as you probably know, our phones blew up. So what we did is we recorded the most frequently asked questions and incorporated them into this website so that folks can actually have them there. And we also made sure not to use higher education jargon and language. We are using language that we all speak and can understand when it comes to education so that folks understand, do I qualify? Do I not qualify? How can I qualify? What are the types of things that I need to ask so that any person walking down the sidewalk can understand what Reach Higher NM is trying to do? And that was really important for us to make it non-governmental and also get away from higher education and governmental language that we typically use uh, when it comes to our constituents. So the biggest ask for today is, please share this website. I would love enrollment to go up. I would love to show the legislature that this is a program that is needed in New Mexico to build our workforce and also really fill in a uh, high need area such as nurses, doctors. We need teachers, we need social workers, we need folks in the construction and trades, renewable energy sphere. And going back to school or going to school and getting those credentials would get you there with high wages. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and close the presentation. And I thank Dr. Trujillo for helping and navigating the screen as I went through that. But um, thank you for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Secretary Rodriguez. We really appreciate that information. Do you have a, a few minutes for questions from the group as well? Great. Um, so I will open it up. I think it may be um, most helpful for folks to go ahead and use the raise hand icon. So that way I can see uh, who's ready to speak. And so I can call on folks um, when they're ready to ask their question. If you would prefer to put it in the chat, that's another option as well. All right, Angelica. Hi, good afternoon. Um, the question, I'm a school counselor um, with APS at a high school. Um, the confusion I'm hearing the most is about lottery versus opportunity. And if there's one handout, maybe that is already available um, that shares those like differences or similarities, because what I'm hearing is, OK, seniors or graduates can't get the opportunity because they have the lottery. Um, so those are the biggest um, things that I'm hearing on the high school level side right now. I don't know if there's just like a simple flyer that we can share. I did just share um, these two awesome websites um, in our um, graduates Google Classroom and I'll send out to our senior parents as well. Um, but the, is there just a flyer available or maybe even a post on our social media that we can share out? So fantastic question, Akhilika, thank you. Yes, we do have a one-page document that we actually presented in Roswell last week. Some of you were actually at that convening. I see Dr. Seals on here, actually. Um, I'm more than happy to follow up and provide that to you, Angelica. That really talks about the differences between the two. And uh, reach higher. Yes, please continue sharing it. PED sent it out on a newsletter blast, but I think I need to bug them a little bit more to help me with that. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much. And Jim, you had a question. Yes, I've heard it characterized a little bit as a as a last dollar uh, 
scholarship that if you got the lottery and it only covered like 80% of the tuition that you could use the opportunity to fill in what parts the, uh, you know, your other scholarships uh, didn't cover is that the case? And, you know, so my, my thinking is, does that mean that we, uh, we want to consult with students and try to make sure that they maximize their other scholarships first before they go to opportunity to, you know, I was thinking of it as something to. Yeah, so this is a question that we get a lot, and I'm going to, I'm going to be very forward with you all. It's a complicated answer, but I'm going to do my best to answer this right now. For returning adult learners, non-traditional students, this is a first or middle dollar program in which tuition free and fees are covered at 100%. The first thing we take is state aid. So if they qualify for the teacher affordability scholarship, that would be applied first, and then opportunity would fill in the rest of the gaps. Or potentially opportunity could cover all tuition and fees for the student. Now for lottery, because the legislature was very adamant on keeping them two separate programs, this is how it's gonna work. The bridge semester is a semester that could basically bankrupt the opportunity scholarship. So what we have done in rule is say, other aid that is not covered for that student will be applied first and opportunity will fill in the gaps. However, the second semester, the student will get lottery and opportunity to cover fees. But that first semester bridge semester is really, really hard and something we're navigating without completely deplenishing the opportunity scholarship. So that's the very complicated answer. But lottery and opportunity can also stack very nicely with one another because lottery covers tuition, opportunity covers fees. So we'll cover those fees for those lottery students after that first semester where they get eligibility for the lottery. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. I see. OK, I'm going to let you do this. <laughs> either, either way. Yeah, I see that Jimmy had a question. Oh, hey, thanks, team. Um, mine is on transfer from a two-year to a four-year institution. Um, does the GPA completion ratio maximum time frame follow the student over, or do they have to have a qualifying term when they go from a two-year to a four-year? It follows them over. Okay, very good. And another follow-up question if a student falls, God forbid, to a 2.49, that will disqualify them for opportunity scholarship. But if they bring that up the next term, will they requalify? The answer is yes. And there's actually a clause in the opportunity scholarship that saves these students, and it's called extreme mitigating circumstances. So if they do fall below that cumulative, so remember it's cumulative, which is really good because you may have a bad semester, but you don't fall behind or below 2.5. But let's say you do, you can build up that the next semester and continue to qualify for the opportunity scholarship. However, that is the decision of the institution and the financial aid office. Okay, very good, thank you. And I also see a, a question in the chat from Eric. Is this available for young people who are trying to reconnect with academia and are in need of a diploma or high school equivalent? I think young people trying to reconnect lack the tools and confidence and GED uh, high school equivalency um, go hand in hand. So individuals who receive a high school equivalency, including the GED and high set, do qualify for the opportunity or lottery scholarships, as a matter of fact. So this is really seen as a pathway for anybody who has a high school equivalency or diploma, um, they will be accepted into these programs. And if I misunderstood your question, I apologize and I'm happy to have an offline conversation or if you'd like to elaborate, please let me know. Yeah, um, I think um, like a lot of the youth that I deal with have been out of school for you know, years and uh, reconnecting um, and getting that. Like, I, I think I've had a hard time um, helping these youth earn um, GEDs or high school equivalent, especially 
um, during the pandemic. Um, so I was just kind of like wondering if it, to what extent um, those youth could, could um, you know, get from this opportunity. Um, but yeah, that does answer my question. And just so you know, I appreciate your question because I actually was a high schooler who had to go through the adult education system and I almost dropped out of college or high school. So I appreciate your question. Um, but yes, we're trying to connect the two. We've already been working with our adult education programs because we actually oversee that at HED. A lot of people think it's PED, but it's our secret little gem that we really pride ourselves in. And we are starting to work with those programs to better connect high school equivalency and pathways into higher education or vocational education. And then we'll go on to Sierra. Thank you. Um, one of the things that my students tend to encounter is they may have an associate's degree or two um, and they come and try to get their bachelor's degree because they've hit a dead end in their career. Um, I work in EMS education. So they hit a dead end in their career until they um, get their bachelor's degree or they can't get any more payment or anything like that, but they've already got 160, 70, 80 credits. I know that this is sort of newly expanding. Is that something that maybe in a few years can be looked at as far as like increasing that credit limit? Because they're having a really hard time qualifying for basically any funding to finish out their last like year of their degree. It's a conversation we're definitely open to. I'm going to tell you, that was one of the, the compromises we had to make during the session with the legislature were those caps. So 90 credit hours for associate degrees and um, 160 hours for bachelor's degrees, which are actually pretty generous compared to other states. However, keep in mind that those folks can actually go get certificates. So if they want to continue to stack, the certificate avenue is a way to do that. However, I do know the importance of getting a bachelor's degree for some of these areas, but yeah, that's something that is limiting with those caps, but something we're open to in the future if we need to open it up again in the legislature. And then I saw a question that I want to answer really fast in the chat. And um, if you have a bachelor's degree, can you go back and get another degree? No, this is only for individuals who have not received a bachelor's degree at this point in time. And Julia. Good afternoon, Secretary. My question is, how are we going to create a collaborative relationship between the colleges and the Workforce Connection Department so we stay informed about the certificate programs that are in demand and qualify for the Opportunity Scholarship? Hi, Julia. What organization are you with, just so I have a better understanding? Central New Mexico Community College. Hi there. So Hi. the first step in that was Ready NM. Ready NM actually is a partnership with the Department of Workforce Connections as well, and all of our colleges and universities with associate degrees and vocational education programs are in and part of that website, and we're actually involved in getting that set up, including CNM. CNM actually inspired that website with an old website that they had really started, which was Restart New Mexico, but we changed the branding a little bit to say, no, we're ready, we're ready, we're not restarting, we're ready to go. Um, so that has been one of the first steps. However, if there's ways that we can improve that with CNM and Workforce Connections, I'm all ears so that we can improve those uh, coordination, collaboration, and communications. But I really encourage you to check out that website. Thank you. Take another from the chat. Um, Veronica asked, how does the Pell Grant fall into play with the Opportunity Scholarship? I'm happy you asked this because this was a lot of fun to fight for, right? <laughs> so Pell Grant actually gets to be applied last towards cost of attendance. So housing, childcare, transportation, books and materials, opportunity and lottery scholarships are the ones that actually eat up tuition or tuition and fees. So I'm really excited to tell you that Pell Grants will actually be applied last so that they can have those other things paid for um, and be more successful in school, because we've seen that when we cover cost of attendance in addition to tuition and fees, students' likelihood of graduating and graduating on time actually increases. Now, remember that bridge semester, though. That bridge semester for lottery students has always been done like this. It will eat up institutional, private, or Pell Grant federal grants first, but then the second semester and onward, it will always be last for cost of attendance. So that's the only caveat. 
Um, but for opportunity, it will be cost of attendance only for all semesters, no bridge scholarship required. And I'll go ahead. The next question is somewhat related um, also from Jim. It was talking about often students are worried that by their senior year, they may have maxed out their Pell Grant eligibility. Um, so how would that come into play in that kind of case? So remember, Pell Grant will be applied last. So the only thing that will happen here is we'll continue to pay tuition and fees through the Opportunity Scholarship. However, they would probably have to look for other resources towards cost of attendance when it comes to Pell Grant once that's even met. And Anne. Good afternoon, and uh, my name is Anne, and I'm from a TRIO Student Support Services Program at UNM Main Campus. And since the news were out about the Opportunity Scholarship, I got a lot of questions about students. Oh, they said there's a tuition free program now. Am I qualified? And you know, a lot of verbiage using on the website, I, you may qualify for this. And we asked the questions to a financial aid officer here at the institution, but the question is they still don't know. And from, I think last month, so most of the students already received the financial aid package and some of them didn't receive like an estimated opportunity scholarship and stuff like that. So is there an umbrella, you know, um, criteria or regulations or instructions on how financial aid would run those opportunity scholarship because not everybody gets it. Yeah, so. thank you so much for that question. And yes, so the legislative session ends and then that's already when our schools are doing the financial aid awards and packages and letters to our students. So it was really hard Right now, the Opportunity Scholarship is in the rulemaking phase. We're working on the rules, and those will be established and ready to go July 1. Um, we have been educating financial aid offices on how the rules are developed right now at this point in time and should be applied, but that was not before those letters went out to students. But just know we've consulted every single financial aid director in the state of New Mexico and our public colleges and we've incorporated comments, feedback, or responses to every single one of them. We also reached out to all of our presidents and chancellors, and I think we're in a really good place for that. And as soon as those are established July 1, all of the financial aid directors, including the ones at your institutions, will know how to package this correctly. Thank you. And just to, you know, clarify a little bit. So, um, so there would be, you know, regulations on how to run the scholarships and it just doesn't determine based off. I mean, I'm assuming it's going to based off on their, you know, uh, financial situation most of the time. And does it prioritize, you know, adult learners? Because, you know, this is the, 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 the effort to help adult learners go back to school and stuff like that. So. So the prioritization structure for opportunity scholarship is the adult learner that does not qualify for lottery scholarship. We mm -hmm. want as many high school students going into lottery and using those dollars and not eating up the opportunity. So yes, it qualifies those adult learners. And it also prioritizes in the event, which this is not going to happen because you all are going to support this program for many, many years. But in the event that we dip below the full funding of the Opportunity Scholarship, it prioritizes low income students with an expected family contribution of X amount that's very low. So that prioritization structure is in place in the event that it is not funded. But I know all of you are gonna make sure with me that it is funded for many, many years. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. And Jody has a question. Uh, are previously incarcerated students eligible for the Opportunity Scholarship? Yes. So we did not want to put any limitations for that in the Opportunity Scholarship within the statute because we understand folks um, need education regardless of your path or your, the way you got there. Education is important for all New Mexicans. So that was important to us. Um, the only caveat to that is some higher ed institutions have policies that actually govern who can get accepted into an institution, but that is set at the college or university. But as far as opportunity, if you get accepted into that university or college, regardless of that, you will get opportunity scholarship. And that was really important for us. And we're actually going to be partnering with the Department of Workforce Corrections to actually also implement it within their facilities as well. 
And I also see Mark had a question. How does the scholarship fit in with the state's um, ECECD scholarship for child care workers? Which scholarship should a child care worker apply for first? This is a great question. Um, they will actually get opportunity first to cover tuition and fees. And then the ECECD scholarships will function as a stipend for the cost of attendance. We still have a few minutes left for questions. Any other questions coming up that folks would like, Jim? I just, I'm, I'm getting a sense that this could be even more than its actual financial thing. It seems like a psychological difference because I have talked to so many students that don't go to financial aid because they think, gosh, I'll go to financial aid and I'll jump through all these hoops and fill out all this stuff. And with everything done, I still won't quite have money to cover it. And I'm trying to tell students that, look, the state's trying to do something so that if you go to financial aid and you start the process, that you now know that you will be successful. And somehow, once you reach the end of it, you will actually have, you know, put together a package so that you can attend. And that, to me, psychologically, the difference between thinking that I'll go to financial aid and maybe I'll, maybe I'll succeed, but I probably won't, versus it's a guaranteed lock that once I go there and start doing it and I'm accepted for school, that it will come together. I would think that this could this enables a set of students who specifically have been the ones that have been reticent to go to school in the first place because they're they're concerned that I'll commit and next thing I know I'm going to be deep in debt before school even starts. So I think it's a it's a very psychologically enabling uh, statement about the opportunity. So I'm so happy you brought this up because when I was sitting in the governor's office talking about this in the beginning, she says, we make financial aid too complicated for students and their parents. Simplify it and simplify it now, Stephanie, I want it done tomorrow. <laughs> and so, you know, the easiest way to do it is just cover tuition or cover tuition and fees. Don't worry about stacking, 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 stacking. Just let students know it's covered. An opportunity was an attempt to do that. And we're hoping it can, or it can be uh, maybe even more simplified in the first future. So another thing I want to let you know is we actually consolidate all college affordability scholarships minus lottery into one fund. So all of our scholarships exist there now in opportunity versus I qualify for student incentive, I qualify for this, and I qualify for opportunity, and I'm going to skip back them to make a package. No, they've all collapsed. They're all opportunity. All of the dollars for those programs are in the opportunity fund to make it simple. So thank you for your comment. I couldn't agree more. And if we can make it more simple and we're not making it simple enough, you need to tell me. I have one more in the chat and then we'll get to Veronica. Um, so this question is from Victoria. Would it also be available for grad students? At this point in time, no, it's only for undergraduate students. We want those students to be entering the workforce in those wages, whereas individuals who already have bachelor's degrees or are working on a graduate degree may be able to get those higher wages already. However, I am open to adding more dollars to our graduate student scholarship in the future and making those more available for New Mexicans going to grad school. All right, you're up, Veronica. Nice to see you. Thank you. Um, so I'm with Department of Workforce Solutions. I work closely <laughs> um, under uh, Deputy Secretary Yolanda Montoya Cordova. And my role with the department is I oversee the Title I funds, uh, which everyone refers to as the WIOA funds. Um, so I ha just have a quick question about, um, and forgive me for not have diving deep into the website yet, but um, certification certificates so is the opportunity scholarship going to cover those non-credit certificate programs great question no it only covers credit bearing certificates so that we can capitalize on VOA dollars for those non-credit certificates perfect because i was in a really good conversation with um unm continuing ed last week and they were still unsure as well. So I will relay that message back to, to, their, um, to those individuals. So thank you. 
Thank you. And th it's good to see you. I had seen your name in emails in the past. You worked with my team. I think it was Pascal. Thank you for all of your help. Oh, we love Pascal. Yeah, you were <laughs> very you. helpful. So thank you. <laughs> And I also have got a, a message uh, asking about if you need to fill out the FAFSA to be eligible. I know you said you encourage folks to fill out the FAFSA, but do they need to? No, it's highly encouraged. It's not a requirement. And then also remember, you know, we do have an undocumented population in New Mexico. And sometimes filling out a FAFSA or a federal document is not something we want to do willingly, including members of my family who are undocumented. So we encourage them to do the paper FAFSA if they're able to. But if not, that does not exclude them from the Opportunity Scholarship. Great. Thank you. And then another message in the chat from Sage, will current students on lottery be eligible for this or still need to follow the lottery requirements? They will need to follow the lottery requirements, including that bridge semester. However, we will be using opportunity if we do not deplete the fund for their fees. So lottery doesn't cover fees for lottery students. Uh, it only covers tuition, but opportunity could be used to cover those fees for them. Wonderful. So we are at the end of our, our time, and I can't express how thankful I am, uh, Secretary Rodriguez, that you're able to join us today and provide all of this wonderful information. It, it is very exciting um, that New Mexico has undertaken this endeavor, and I'm very much also looking forward to that longitudinal data and seeing what happens for our communities. Thank you all so much for having me. Thank you for the questions. I know this is very complicated. We're trying to make it simple, but if there's ways we can make this better or more simple for you, students, parents, families, guardians, please let us know. That's our overall goal. And then I just want to shout out to all of the higher education institutions on this call and adult education programs. I see you all. I've seen your names before. And, you know, I couldn't do my work without all of you. And I appreciate you all so much and what you're doing to support students on the ground level, because it was folks like you who kept me in school and allowed me to be the youngest cabinet secretary in the nation for education. So thank you for all you do. Bravo. Yeah, I'm so excited to have so many folks being able to join our session today. Great. Well, we will um, then shift over to the case study presentation uh, portion. Um, I will go ahead and stop recording.